So, with no further ado, I want to go ahead and introduce uh, Bob Bowman. Bob is going to give our talk this evening, and uh, he holds a BS and MS and PH degrees in chemistry and is employed at Mound Laboratory from 1969 until he left as a science fellow in 1984. After Mound, he worked for three aerospace organizations in Southern California. Bob is currently employed at Oak Ridge National Laboratory and also a director on the board of the Mound Science and Energy Museum. I want you to welcome Bob this evening, and uh, I'm sure you're going to find his talk very entertaining. Come on up, Bob. Thank you. Make me live so I don't have to shout. Oh, there we go. Good. Okay, well, welcome everybody. Uh, we're going to talk about the uh, American who gave the atomic bomb to the Soviet Union. And that's li literally what he did. And uh, it's quite a story. It, it includes a lot of things. Uh, so I'm not going to hold it up. Uh, if we go to the next slide. Uh, before I start, I want to acknowledge. Uh, Several divisions. One is Professor Alexander Skripkov from Russia. He's my friend and colleague. He actually provided me with a lot of Russian sources. Did some translating, but not enough. And uh, but I, I have a, a colleague at Oak Ridge who's a, a, a Soviet-born uh, Alexander Kolonsov, and he also helped me translate some of the documents, uh, some of the information. Uh, Don Solinger gave a talk on. Koval about seven years ago, and I borrow stuff from Don. He, he also provided me with a lot of information, so I, I don't want to forget that. Dick Matty, who's an archivist here at the mound for a decade, had a lot of things that I, I took. And I finally want to acknowledge the internet. That is an amazing tool, by the way. And you can find out all kinds of stuff. You can't always believe what you see, but you can get a lot of information. And I'm still plumbing and trying to, to find out more. And uh, so he, here's an outline of the, of the material I'm going to cover. I'm going to confess up front, I ran out of time before I ran out of putting figures and stuff in place. So I'm going to have to wing it a little bit. You'll still see a lot of information. But I needed another half day or so to put another ten or so figures in there. So if there's a repeat somewhere, you'll have an opportunity to see more. But I'm going to try to cover these content about George Caval, uh, Born in the USA, he was born in Iowa. Uh, the, uh, when the Kovals went to the Soviet Union in the 1930s, how he became a Soviet spy when he comes back. Uh, also, uh, about the Manhattan Project, I'm not going into great detail on that right now. You can, you can find more information. But then it's what happened after World War II and he, when he returned to the Soviet Union. And then his life in the Soviet Union from 1948 to 2006. So you see, he lived almost 60 years back in the, in, in the Soviet Union. And uh, then his, after his death, he was given an award by uh, 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 President Putin uh, as a hero of the Russian Federation and what after that. And then uh, a, a little bit on the legacy and epilogue uh, related to, to the event. So. Uh, let me start in the beginning, and that is that Abram Koval, who was a, ca a carpenter, and his wife Ethel uh, were, were both Jewish, and they lived in a small uh, village near Minsk in, in Belarus, here in this part. There was, there was a very large population of, 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 of Jewish people living there, but they were also uh, persecuted and, and put down, uh, down tremendously by the Tsar's uh, anti-Semitic uh, policy. And they were disenchanted. So as a young couple in 1910, they were in their early 20s, they uh, immigrated to the United States, the uh, land of opportunity. And if you see the next slide, this is where they ended up, Sioux City, Iowa, you know, right in the middle. Uh, right, right, right in here, Sioux City. Well, it turns out there's actually a, uh, Sioux City was a growing town in the early part of the 20th century, a city with uh, and they had visions of becoming the next Chicago. And they actually uh, encouraged people from Eastern Europe to settle there. So the Kovalv ended up there, and they had three sons that were born. Uh, Israel, that was uh, Isaiah, that was born in 1912. Uh, George was born on Christmas Day, 1913. Although there are some 
references that say he was born in 1914. And most, most people put it 1913, but there are some documents that say he might have been 14, but uh, we'll kind of go with the majority. And then there was a younger brother, uh, uh, Gabriel, who was born in, in 1919. So the three of them were there. They, uh, they were living in basically a, a, an enclave of Jewish families in, in Iowa. And the next slide, this shows a photograph that this is George. You'll see, because I, I know you have to look pretty far back, so I, I tend to circle him when he's there. And I, these may well be his brothers here. You know, this, this one, the dark hair, the smaller one. But with, and I can't tell whether that's an animal or they're just, uh, what they're, they're, they're doing. But this is a family portrait or a, a picture with some, some, some young ladies and maybe a mom. Uh, in, uh, look, look at the house, I'm pretty sure it's somewhere in Iowa, it's a Midwest place. And, and they were living well there, uh, making a living, probably lower middle class, but uh, still doing okay. And George uh, was very bright and excelled very well. And if you have the next slide, they lived a few blocks from the Sioux City Central High School. This high school building was built about 1890, looks like a, you know, a big castle citadel. And this is where he went through school uh, and uh, uh, did pretty well. Uh, next, next slide. This is from his senior yearbook, uh, 1929, George. He was a general person. Uh, the Cresmonian so uh, Society, was a sec that's like a literary club. I had to look it up in the dictionary. That's what the internet's for, to find out some, <laughs> some kind of thing. And, and there was a group of guys. He's there. He was the uh, interscholastic debate uh, team, Honor Society, and it says here, a mighty man is he. So he's only 15 when he graduated. Next. Uh, this is the debate society with George right in the middle. And uh, he, they won some debates. They were apparently very competitive. He was also, uh, his family was involved in the, in the Soviet movement by then. That was in the, you know, the mid-20s. And uh, so he, talked about in school. People remembered after the, in the 50s when they started investigating him that he at least uh, espoused some communist uh, feelings. But again, there were a lot of feelings in the 20s about different societies, what people wanted to do. And so, but he was apparently an excellent scholar. And the next slide, uh, this is, uh, he was a honor student as the youngest member of the class, 15 when he graduated high school, which is no mean feat in any time period. But he also liked to play baseball. Uh, he didn't play team, but you know he was an all-American kid. He was born in Iowa, you know. Uh, <laughs> played baseball, uh, probably chased girls, and but studied hard. What does the footnote uh, Zhukov AP this, mean on your slides? This is from a book where I took the uh, slides from. This is a, a, a Russian book, so this is the author Zhukov, and this is the title of the book. So when I, when I copied them and used them from somebody, I at least identify where they came from. So, most of the time. All right, All right next please. So, uh, and, and this came actually, this would come off the internet. This would be Iowa State sophomore class and from their 1932 yearbook. It's amazing what you can find with Ancestry.com and so forth. And this is George Cabal, you know, I'm sure that's him, this eyeglasses, the hair. He was an electrical engineering major. Uh, 1932, you know, that the, the Depression was really hitting hard. And I think the Cobalt families were, were suffering that. And they were thinking that, at least the father was, that maybe it was time to move on. George was doing well in school, but there, you know, there were other issues. So, uh, next slide. Uh, because of that, uh, Ab Abram, is, now this is a group passport picture taken in 1932 of the family. So that's Abram and his wife Ethel and uh, George, and, it's, and I assume that's Gabriel and that's his, the older brother. And so what they were going to do is they were going to pack the family up and go back, go to the Soviet Union. It wasn't Russia anymore, it was the Soviet Union. And the father was a secretary in i which is a Yiddish... Uh, organization of Jewish colonization in the Soviet Union. What it, they were doing, they were having a, a Russian homeland set aside in Eastern Russia. 
question is how far east it was. But it was a, a, an alternative to the Zionist movement going back to Palestine. And so uh, the family packed up their belongings, took everything, and headed back to Russia. And next slide. And this is a little description that I found about the Stalin's uh, Zion. This is called the Jewish Autonomous Region. And there were literally thousands of, of foreign Jews who were attracted to this opportunity. This was, you know, they had family roots in the Soviet Union, in Russia. They, uh, the Tsar was gone. Officially, uh, the communist view were Jews were citizens of, of the Soviet Union. They would have opportunity. And they, a lot of them came from the United States. Uh, as, as we know, the United States, particularly in the 20s, had a lot of anti-Semitic feelings too. So uh, these would settle here, and they had a similar lifestyle, that is tilling the land, physical labor, and building socialism. So, you know, the ideal front for the... So, and that's where the Kovals moved. George was a young man. He already in, had been in college, but he, he took well to that, according to the, to the liter literature. He was, he was a, an outgoing bright, mechanically adept man, so young man, so he he would 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 do well. And so but what they found out on the way there, where they were living, next slide, this is where they moved to. This is the the, the uh, Jewish you know this is about as far east as you can get. And this, I mean it's not Siberia up here, but it's way over there. So that's where they settled. They were living here for, for several years. But because George was recognized as having great intelligence and hard work. He was given the opportunity to go to the university in Moscow. Now, you know, that's a long way, but here's Moscow. I put the little star of David here. That's the roots. That's where the family's roots were. That's where they started from. But this is where they ended up. And it turns out that the family stayed there. The rest of his father died there. His, 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 his one brother who matured and, and who got married there and raised children stayed there. The youngest brother, was, was killed in World War II. He died during the fighting in 43. But then a, a lot of Russians died in 43. But the, but the family were, and uh, so this was their home in, in Russia. But, but George went to the, uh, to the university, and next slide. What he entered was the Moscow Dmitry Mendeleev Institute of Chemical Technology. This was a high-end technical school for engineering and chemical sciences that had been founded, it had originally been founded at like a chemical technician school in the 1890s, but by 1920 it was training, educating people to become professionals in chemical engineering and that sort of thing. And George did very well there. He graduated with honors uh, in the field of technology of inorganic substances, you know, for a chemist. He, and he did things like uh, pre, uh, separation of gases. He had a, a thesis on, on krypton separation uh, by using uh, processes. This is a modern picture of the Institute, but it, you know, 100 years ago it was similar. You just, they added on more, and if you go to the website, you'll find new fancy 21st century buildings, but this is the kind of the old Institute, and that's where uh, George went, and he, next slide. But he also, you know, this is a picture that was in the book of uh, on George on ski somewhere, it's flat, it's Russia somewhere. And this is another picture uh, that was from 1937 with George and, and uh, a young woman and a woman and man. You know, if you look at that picture, if you can see, he's a pretty fit young man, you know. Uh, and the, the young woman, I'm pretty sure is his wife to be, because he met a, a, another student there. Next slide, I think that's what he had. And, uh, Ludmilla or Ludmilla, my Russian stinks. I mean, I can read. I, I read even in English. It's, it's bad. But they met and uh, got married. You can see her. You know, they look like a couple in love. Uh, 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 an attractive young woman. So, uh, and not only did he graduate in 1939, he also uh, uh, was now a married man and a Soviet citizen. So he had, you know, become there. Next slide. So now we're going to how did George become the agent Delmar? Delmar was a code name that he had as, as a Soviet agent. So 
the GRU, the military intelligence of the Soviet Army, actively recruited him. And in messages that, it, that George sent to an American friend he had who established contact around 2000, said that after he uh, agreed to, he, he, he decided to do this rather than continuing graduate school. Mm. And, he was, and he was officially drafted into the Army to cover his disappearance. I did, but th what they did, they took him and trained him. He did not accept an offer of military training and services as an army officer. He was never sworn in. He never wore a uniform. Because that meant he was not a Soviet military person. But he was trained. And what they did, what they wanted to do, was go back into the United States. Here was a young man who spent 20 years of his life in Iowa. He was an American by all things. And so what he did is, of course, he had no U.S. passport. He had, he had his family come in 1932 on a, on a, on a one-way ticket to the Soviet Union. So what George did in 1940, he came on a small tanker into the port of San Francisco. He walked through the control point with the captain, his wife, and little daughter, but there were no real customs. He was in the United States. He, he traveled across the country. You know, this was before the United States was in World War II. You'd buy a train ticket and you'd just go where you want, as long as you had some money. When he got to New York City, he was the deputy commander of the GRU station there. And what they, how they worked is that they had a cover. There was an electric company uh, called Raven Electric that was a supplier to General Electric and other comp uh, companies. And what the, what the Soviet spies were doing, they were looking at technology, particularly chemical technology. Because, you know, World War I was chemical warfare. World War II was starting. No one knew whether or not chemical warfare. The Russians wanted to know more what was going on. So, and, and New York, that's where he was. So we started that job and applied. He went under his own name. And, you know, uh, he registered for the draft in January 1942, right after Pearl Harbor, like all. Now, because they had a company that had, you know, a, a military base uh, uh, business, he got a draft deferment for a year. So, whoop, you were jumping ahead of me, weren't you? Yeah. Going back? There we are, close enough. You can, you can look at his wife or something like that. <laughs> so, uh, and, but he, so he, he registered. In 1940, February 1943, he got drafted. Well, yes. Did he have dual citizenship at that time? No. He well, I mean, he, he you know they didn't renounce anything. He didn't do anything. He only went by the fact that he was an American, registered for the draft. The information that they did when they checked him for clearance said, "Well, I was born in Iowa. I went to school here. He was in the census, and then he was a farmer in Iowa." You know, when you're a farmer. In the 30s, you know, there was no social security, there was no document, there was no employment card, you know, there was no income tax, really, I mean, you didn't apply. You were off the grid. And so he said, well, I, you know, in the late 30s, I immigrated to New York and got a job, and that's where I am. So, you know, so he just, he was a U.S. citizen by birth. He didn't have a U.S. passport, you know, he, he, in New York, he didn't need a driver's license, right? Nobody drove, not many people drove, so he didn't need a driver's license. So he got drafted and uh, went in and at Fort Dix, New Jersey, went through basic training. And when the Army was screening him, they did the testing and so forth. He had an IQ, well, the Army equivalent, about 152. <laughs> and he, they had so he had some background. So they put him in a special education Army program to train uh, people with high intelligence. So they went to the Citadel in, in, a, in an engineering department. So for a year or so, he was there. And then there was another program started where they took him to the City College of New York and, 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 and gave them technical training to be engineering training. And I think that's the next slide, maybe. We'll see what we have. Yep. And it's here, this is Goval again in, in red. And one of the students that he uh, was, was close to is Arnold Kermish. They're, they're both Jewish. Uh, they hung out together in that group. This was a small, you know, select group of, of, of army privates selected to be trained in technology. And 
various, and, and they were taking electrical engineering classes for whatever purpose the army might need. And that was, that went on for about a, a, a year or so. And then toward the end of 43, early 44, the United States uh, army said, well, we don't need that. They took, sent a lot of the guys into the infantry. There were a few of them, including Cummish and, and Cobell, that they sent to Oak Ridge National Lab as part of the Manhattan Project. And what they had, they had electronic training and enough chemistry background that we tested well, that they trained them to be health physicists because they needed technicians. By then, Cobell had been promoted to corporal. Uh, and, but before he got there, the next slide, uh, Cobell, who was almost 10 years older than most of us, and most of them were you know, more or less out of high school, he had that 10 years missing, but uh, even though he had a wife in Moscow he told no one about, uh, he was uh, quite a social butterfly. Maybe the James Bond of the group, you know. Uh, this is a, from an FBI file of, of a very attractive young woman and him sometime in the 40s. Uh, you know, and uh, they also remember that he was very good at, at, pass, at faking bed checks so they could go out on, on the town. You know, they were young men with a lot of interest. So you know, it was a, a pretty good life. The reports that came back is everybody liked George. George was easygoing, he was a lot of fun, and they said he talked a little funny for a New Yorker, but you know, for Iowa, yeah. but there was not a hint of any Eastern European language. In fact, his later career in the Soviet Union was trouble because he always spoke with an American accent. You know, because he... So, anyhow, in 1944, the next slide, I think, it's not a very good photograph. Again, it was stolen out of a out of, a, of an online Russian book. So you know, I don't know where they got it from. But George is in here, and he's hard to see. I think he's down in the middle here. Uh, this is when they were actually sent to Oak Ridge. And the next slide, I think. This is Oak Ridge, and he was. Uh, this was the uh, engineering division. So these were enlisted army military people. He, George was now a sergeant, technically, you know, and he was responsible for health physics for instruments, uh, mostly in the X-10 reactor, but in essence, all over the facility. Next slide. So this is a photograph showing some of the building, either right during the Manhattan Project, World War II, and just after, so there were lots of building. Uh, he was given his own jeep, top secret security to ground, because you know, you're always monitoring radioactivity, right? I mean, they were processing uranium, plutonium, polonium in different places. Uh, you know, most of the people that were around there knew how to do the basic job. George, on the other hand, already had other training. He had a chemistry degree, uh, and he also had a handler, a person that he would be feeding. And he, as soon as he found out or as soon as they started sending information back to the Soviet Union, which by they were getting detailed because they didn't know what the what Oak Ridge was for the Soviets. Uh, you know, every, they they knew there was a, 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 a nuclear program taking place in Los Alamos. What Kovala was providing them was the details and the processing that he could see, and you know, the top secret clearance. You know, you know, you're not supposed it's need to know, but you know, the guy's trying to fix your equipment, so you ask what how. Ryan was exposed to do. He's a nice, friendly, easygoing guy. Talks like a guy from the Midwest. You know, who's not to trust? Knows baseball. Probably keeps you up score. You know, how many Soviets know baseball, right? He's an American. So, uh, this continued up through for almost a year. He was there, and then uh, Charles Thomas. For those of you who who worked at Mound or another Dayton project. Charles Thomas founded that. He was here in Dayton. He was ahead of the Dayton project. They were pushing out the, the polonium processing. They needed more technical help. Uh, this was in late June of 1945, just before the Trinity test. They needed some more people. He made a request. And what they did is they sent George Koval up here to be head of the health physics group for the Dayton Project, all the facilities. So he would now, next slide, 
uh, come here, and he would stay past the duration of the war. And in, there's an actual an online interview from American Heritage uh, by a, another member of the Special Engineering Detachment. His name is James uh, Schoke, and he was based at the University of Chicago. And he would develop the instrumentation and calibrate, and then he would come down to Dayton, uh, among other locations, and meet with Cobalt. And he said, I would go there quite often. I had to train him how to maintain the equipment. He was an excellent technician. He knew his job. He was very friendly. And of course, I didn't have any idea he was a spy. He was, and so George stayed working here. Uh, next slide. This is a photograph. I'm pretty sure that it was taken probably not long after the uh, atomic bombs were dropped in Japan in, in 45. You see it's summertime. Uh, again, that's George right there in the group. I'm positive. That's Charles Thomas, the head of there. So it was, you know, it was a pretty small organization. Uh, and, uh, but here he is because Monsanto wanted him to stay on. The, uh, but George wasn't going to have anything to do with that. Uh, in, 19, in, in February 1946, he was uh, discharged from the Army. He was a draftee. He was given his discharge papers. Uh, but he was also aware that the Army had investigated his clearance. There were not a lot of paperwork. Not the FBI or somebody else at that time. He was not interested in staying along where you get reinvestigated. Cause it wasn't a one-shot deal. Once you start, they would continue to investigate you. Anybody that had a security clearance knows that you know they can always keep looking. And so what he decided to do, he went back to New York City, re-entered the CCNY, and completed his education. In 1948, he graduated cum laude in electrical engineering from CCNU. He was still working for a cover company uh, in, uh, in New York City and obtained a passport for go overseas. He was for an Atlas training company to be a, a technical representative. So he was going to go overseas. Well, he got on a boat, went to Europe, never heard from him again in the United States. He was gone. He was crossed over. Uh, next slide. He, so he talked about discharge. He graduates, gets a passport, and he's gone. So I told you the story for the few words there. Next. Then came August 29, 1949. The Soviets detonated their own atomic bomb. Nice, nice big blast. Of course, that, the United States thought their official position was it'd be at least five years, maybe eight or nine, it might be 1953 or 54, before the Soviets could independently develop the technology that the Americans thought it was so difficult to, to, to do, and therefore it would be uh, quite a while. They were really shocked. Well, you know, that started a lot of people looking about spies, and that's where they started, you know, they had spies like Klaus Fuchs, who was British, and so forth. They found out the name was Delmar, but they didn't know quite who Delmar was, um, at least not until the 50s. And then they started, they found out, come on, they found out that there were big gaps. That, you know, he had left the United States in 32. They didn't know where he was. He came back, and then he had all this. They knew where he was because there was all the paperwork. And they talked about people. And, yeah, he's a nice, friendly guy and all this good stuff, but they didn't know where he was. Uh, turned out he had gone back. He reported to his superiors at uh, GRU. He wrote a report. Uh, they, their intelligence agency, were going undergoing some changes. You know. Stalin was a pretty unstable guy, and so he was always stirring up things and changing stuff. So, uh, basically, what they did with Cabal is say, okay, you're discharged as a private. No promotion, nine years, and, uh, uh, and you were a translator. No, technically. And he just said, you're done. So he, had a, he apparently found his wife again. Went back to, uh, to the university, went into the graduate program, and started, and started his, his degree uh, research. I don't know if the next slide has. Yeah. And so he worked in the chemistry lab. He was a lab assistant, not making much money. And there he is in 1952, sitting in the 
in the uh, back row, not making a, uh, much money. He, in 1953 or so, he contacted one of the GRU managers, person there, and said, you know, I'm having a very difficult time making a living, and there's something you can do. So they wrote a letter from GRU saying that he did special services during the war, and he was, he was really a good guy, he really, was, he really contributed to the war effort. That was sent to the university. The university hired him as a, as a paid research assistant. And slowly, an assistant professor, or a, 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 an instructor. And, there, and that's so he was now started on the faculty of, of the Mendel Lake University and would teach and do research there. I think the next slide show him that in 57, he, with the other faculty, uh, he was made head of the high pressure laboratory. He was responsible for a lot of the teaching, but Mussolini was a, he did have his, his doctorate by then. 52, but you'll see he's kind of in the back row of the staff, the, the more senior people sit down, and he's there. Uh, but he continued uh, there in the next slide, showed 1969. Well, you know, he's been there close to 20 years. He's now sitting on the, in the front row uh, and uh, with, with a bunch of the other staff people. They're doing chemical engineering. He ends up having uh, he, he's doing research in, in, in chemical engineering, materials, uh, phase separation. He has eight PhD graduate students that he uh, responsible for. He publishes over a hundred papers in the, all in Russian journals, all in Russian things. Nothing of his published work is available in English translation. So it's all done in Russia. No, no, no American interaction. No European interaction. All in the Soviet Union. So, excuse me. As soon as he goes over, and he's in the Russian faculty of this university. He did, he, do, do, do Americans say, "Hey, that's our guy"? No one. No one notices. No one notices. You know. <laughs> I mean, the thing is. No, no American chemists aren't even paying attention. To well, he's research. not. Remember, he's not publishing in the international literature. The, the, the you know the the thing. So there's not an information that says you're out. You're being visible. Maybe uh, the American high pressure chemist or something who. Yeah, but this is not the but e ease of finding papers and, and, and then it, as it was now. Not the behind, the curtain, behind the iron curtain. Behind the iron curtain. They, they didn't communicate with us. They didn't. The, uh, you know, it, it took another twenty years before the you know the seventies and eighties there was more interchange and translation. But you know, when we look at the papers now, they were in Russian literature in l Russian journals. Yes. Have you looked him up in Kim Master? Yes. There's there's four or five Russian language papers. Yeah. That's all it all it shows. All they got. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, this was in Web of Science. I only came out of a Web of Science. Are those later papers too? Mm, yes, yeah, seventies or eighties. So the earlier paper, you know, probably wouldn't be there. So, but at the university, from what I was told by the people that translated some of that stuff, he was well thought of. He, they, people liked him. I guess he was a, he was he was a conscientious teacher, you know, he, and so forth. But he wasn't on 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 uh, any bright star. He certainly was, wasn't illuminated out where people would would see where what he was, you know, outside do that. He was in a in a since an engineering type in technology place. So there's not as much international. Work. So he continued to do that until 1986. When he officially retired, and I'm going on a retirement pension, you know. So it wasn't a lot of money, but he was doing that. Uh, next slide. Uh, in fact, by 2000, he was getting a little desperate for funds, so he contacted the U.S. Social Security Department. <laughs> there was a there was apparently a rule that if you served during World War II as an American citizen, no matter where you were, you could apply for Social Security. So they, you know, in 1999 sent him the form. The next slide. This is a copy of his completed form. You know, he place of birth, Sioux City, Iowa. You know, his father's name. Uh, you know, he says he now re resides in Moscow, Russia. He's a U.S. citizen. It's right here, he didn't say dual citizen. He says U.S. citizen. You know, I mean, he never revoked. He never denied his citizenship. He was a U.S. citizen. Uh, 
So he sent it in to Social Security, and a couple months later, he got this message back. Uh, Disapproval of note. We are right to tell you that you do not qualify for retirement benefits. It's pretty apparent that the government knew that he was a spy by then. But the United States wasn't about to admit that they had had a guy who gave him information still out running loose. So, you know, and we're, we're going to get anyone. That's pretty good. About that time, the, 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 there were people in the Soviet Union who were starting to figure out who Delmar was. Delmar was his code name. And, you know, the Soviet Union had broken up. It was now the Russian Federation. And the, the KGB and the other were, things were becoming more open. And so there was information that a Delmar had, had agent named Delmar had worked in that. Um, in 2000, he was given a, an award as an international uh, agent uh, that uh, gave service to the country in World War II. That's the medal he received. There he is wearing it. Uh, it was sort of in the 90th ce year celebration of the Secret Service, what they had for intel military intelligence. Next slide. So here he is wearing his, after the ceremony, he has a certificate. I, I have what I think is a photocopy of that certificate. I didn't put it up because it's all in Russian, but it's a pretty certificate, you know. So, uh, and here he is probably with the official that gave it to him. You see, this is 2000, so, you know, George is like 87 years old, but, you know, he has a cane, but he's there. And about that time is when the American Arnold Kamish finds out that Koval is living in Moscow, and they send a letter, and it gets forwarded, and it starts exchanging. They talk about why. George never outright said, I was a spy. He never said regret that he ever did anything. It was his patriotic duty to the Soviet Union, because I think he had bought into the Soviet Union. And he, that's where a couple of those quotes that I did earlier came from those communications about how he got in and what he did. So, uh, in 1999, George's wife had, had passed away. So, but he he had they had no children. There's no record of any children. His youngest brother had been killed in World War II, but his older brother had married, had three daughters and a son, and they had children. And George would go routinely to, to the family retreat in you know in eastern Russia and and go with the fam, be with the family. So the family was close, and his niece would come, his grand niece would come to Soviet uh, to Moscow. <laughs> occasionally to be with him. His, his nephew, who went to the Mendeleev, stayed with him for a while back. So he stayed close to his family. He was, you know, retired. Now. And in 2006, in January, he passed away at the age of, of 93. And so there was not still much known, but a lot of that changed then in 2007. I think the next slide. That's when uh, a man you all recognize, he's 10 years <laughs> younger there, uh, at a ceremony, the story that we read is that Putin went into the head of the military intelligence office, and there was a plaque in the name of George Kovac. He said, who is that guy? And the, the, obviously the intelligence agents knew what he had done, and said he had made an immense contribution to the defense. And so that he was the only, so that Kovac was the only Soviet intelligence officer to penetrate the U.S. Secret Committee uh, facilities that, that involved plutonium, enriched uranium, polonium. That he, that he was there. So next, because of that, to the, to the defense minister, he gave a gold star medal and a hero of Russian certificate to be uh, uh, exhibited in their museum for Joseph Kaval, Kaval uh, as a permanent display. And that was in November of 2007. Next. That's, those are pictures of that. That's the certificate, you know, for what he got his name for doing that for Delmar, and uh, so it's a, a a a pretty medal. This is uh, with the other medal. He had a few other medals that he had. He only got a couple, but you know, Russians are big on medals. So some <laughs> Russians are big on medals. So whatever you did, you you, you get. But there they are toasting him, and uh, of course, about this time that makes international news. All kinds of people start. There was a Russian article that uh, 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 came out around 2000. War of them came out. Next, please. 
2013, there was actually a, a memorial service or, or a centennial cel celebration, whatever you want to say, honoring. And that was at uh, Mendeleev uh, Institute where people they were talking about it. And at the same time, there were two books released. I think that's, both of them in Russian. Neither one have been translated, although both are online. So if you read Russian, or have a good friend to read Russian, contact me, I'll email it to you. The only thing you have to do is provide me some translation of what you find out. So I don't know what they're saying. But, you know, it, it's hard to squeeze more than a few words or a couple pages out of somebody before they don't want to translate for it. That's what I found out this fall, this winter, that, you know, uh, but again, these, these describe uh, uh, Levendeff was one of his students, and actually very close to him. And next slide. That's the author of Levendeff. And so this is, uh, you know, he, he was very close uh, to his old professor, and, and they, uh, uh, so it, it, but there's really a lot of testimonial, a lot of details about the, his students and his, and his life there that I can't, I haven't been able to translate. I'm not going to learn Russian to do that. I'm, waiting, I'm lazy. I'm somebody else will tell me what it says. But, uh, so having done that, what did he really give? And so, obviously there was a limit to what I can say, but let me go next. That's the explosion that, that really changed history. You know, if anything, that's accelerated the Cold War. That explosion, because that said that the arms race started because the Soviet Union had, quote, caught up. We didn't have a hydrogen bomb yet, we, and, you know, we, we had atomic bombs. The Soviet Union were, was already there. And next. This is the Soviet bomb. This is Joe 1 that they detonated. This, this is actually a model, a mock-up of what it looked like. But it externally looks very, very similar to Trinity and the fact that these are the plutonium bombs. These are the ones that have the uh, initiator that were, that were made, the process at the Dayton project here. Uh, next. That's a mock-up at Los Alamos. That's Batman. If you go back one, now go forward. Externally, they look like the same thing. And internally, they're apparently very similar. Next. This is Batman on Tinian Island on its, just before it flew to Nagasaki. So, you know, you can see all the pictures you want about Nagasaki explosions and so forth. It's on the internet. Remember, internet, lots of pictures. Uh, but uh, so the inside of this is what's important, and that's the part that George. The, the next slide. This is a schematic. This is urchin. Urchin. This is the part, the polonium beryllium part, that the polonium was was produced at Oak Ridge, brought here to Dayton, processed into a form that it could be put into this initiator, the center of the. They had uranium on the outside. They had the hollow plutonium sphere. Uh, the role of this was to compress that, and then this chemical explosives around here, link that, force them together. When, when these two elements are pushed together, the polonium, which emits alpha particles, those alpha particles hit beryllium, and they throw out neutrons. Those neutrons initiate the explosion. I'm going to tell you anything you didn't know in any book, anywhere you, you go, but the design on all that how they process it is what, what George Cabal gave the Soviet Union right at the end of World War II. That allowed the Soviet Union to quit step. I mean, they still had to do their work, but now they knew what they, a lot of what they had to do. Because it wasn't just a design, there were recipes. And apparently those recipes were what uh, allowed that to happen. So, uh, and I, and I, not going much further, I think I you know, used up about 45 minutes of time. Uh, I think there's, I don't think there's another slide left, is there? No. So, you know, if we, if we look what happened. Yeah, the bomb. Yeah, the bomb, yeah. Boom. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so he spent time in Oak Ridge. He spent time here. Yeah. We had a lot of problems with, with a, a Russian uh, spy inside the nuclear propulsion project. Uh, yeah. Is there any evidence that he participated in the nuclear airplane? No. Project? No? As far as we can tell, 
course, you know, Russians are not known for, he was completely divorced of everything. When, when, when he came back, went back to the Soviet Union in 1949, his connection ended. He was now a private citizen, and he would complain as best he could uh, that he wasn't getting, you know, he got no recognition, no, for what he could, because he knew what he, I'm sure he knew what he did. He was a very intelligent man. There's no question that he, well, and, and could rap. And, uh, but he never told anyone, he never confirmed, and for 50 years, he never, no one told anything about his role. And the United States didn't say much because they, I'm pretty sure the officials in charge didn't want to know that, you know, a lot of people like Rosenberg who were executed, they really didn't do much of anything as far as giving secrets. There's a, a guy named Hall and Klaus Fuchs. They gave information. But as far as technical information at two of the key players, Dayton and the Oak Ridge side, for a person who had knowledge and the ability to do that, there's no one. That's why, you know, he was unknown. He was literally unknown to the West until 2007. At least to the open lid. I'm sure there were people, because there's like 2,000 pages of documents on his file that got released. So they're, they're released. Where they, but they didn't find much. You know, he lived here, there's some gaps, but he was a nice guy. They didn't say he you know, met with strange people. Apparently he liked women, liked to have a good time, you know. I get this image of this James Bond kind of guy, but he didn't continue. He, did a, he was, he was a one-trick guy, he did that thing, and then he lived a normal, relatively productive life. I mean, you know, you, you teach, you have students, maybe probably a little on the poor side, but again, as he said, you know, in, in the Soviet Union in the 40s and 50s, you could just as easily have gone to the gulag as you could have kept a regular job. They, it didn't take much for somebody to get rid of you or send you off. So, you know, none of that happened to him. He didn't get boosted up very much a couple of times. And so, you know. Okay, well, yeah, thank you. I never saw his name show up in our no. project. So I, yeah. yeah, so as far as I know, he never had, so, you know, I'm going to entertain more questions. I kind of left it open-ended. Uh, yeah, yes. Sorry. Did you, I was trying to say, find out what he ever did say. Did you say he was communicating with someone by letters here in America? He, he didn't, commu however he exchanged information, it's never been divulged. At least it's not open. However he communicated, you know, to his handlers. So we have not pretty much nothing. At least we, there, there's nothing in literature, nothing that we. That, you know, there, there were like Klaus Fuchs had some documents that got a, a Soviet U agent gave them some back 30, 40 years ago. So they had some drawings and stuff. As far as I could find, nothing's out there now. Were they destroyed? Are they still locked in somebody's tight security in the Soviet Union? Could they be in these two Russian books more? I think probably they're more likely to be by personal lifestyle and stuff than they are. That, but I don't know. I don't read Russian, so maybe there's something in there. Yes. When he was here in Dayton, what facility did, did he work in, and where did he live here in Dayton? Okay, he, he actually lived at a, at a, at a, at a, at a boarded a room up on... Uh, in, 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 yeah, there's actually a picture. I was going to put it in, so but it, it's in downtown Dayton. It's near Riverview District. It's it just to, it's been rehabbed. Yeah, it's been rehabbed, so it's still in existence. Now he went mostly to Unit Three, which was near the uh, Bone Break Seminary one. But he would, have, as a health physicist, probably gone to any of the facilities to handle polonium to check instruments or, and and whatever. So there were four active sites in the Dayton area, probably as his head of health physics would have gone to all of them at one time or another. And he was only here from roughly uh, July of 45 until the end of January, because in February 46 he was discharged from the Army. And, you know, I think he took a very smart move and decided, I'm, I'm out of here, I'm disappearing off the radar, I'm going to... But he didn't hurry back to try to get to Russia, he just went back and, you know, takes a lot of cool to do something like that and then just kind of blend back in and, and you know, not not make any waves, just take your opportunities and, and goes. Yes? I, you know, one of the interesting
interesting things, I think, is we were in the process of trying to get this outfit established when the uh, publication came out in 2007. And it didn't create any kind of stir here in Dayton. The only mention that I saw of it at the time was Vic uh, Bikunas, who writes a, a column called Book Notes, sort of mentioned it as an aside some month later. Didn't make the, the, yeah. any of the, the newspapers. So John Reed, who was at uh, the National Park Group then, we had a very good relationship with the National Park people at that time. We were, he and I were avid readers of the New York Times on the internet. And we saw the story that came out by William Brand. Yeah. And that was the first story. And uh, then a couple of years later, the story came out of the Smithsonian, where they did right. a more of a background. Well, we tried to stir up some uh, interest at the Daily News. Finally, we got a hold of uh, Jim DeVos, who was then a, a steady reporter of theirs. And he got interested in it, and at about several months later, really, we got him to write a story. And that's all that's ever come out right. here in this paper. <laughs> yeah. But, but the thing uh, that I found interesting, if you went on the internet, that at the end of the New York Times, they had all the commentary. There were some 200 comments that just <laughs> scanned the whole yeah. realm of things. Some people thought he was a hero, some people thought he was, uh, you know, a traitor, and, and yeah. the, 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 the sort of thing you get out of New York Times commentary. That isn't on the internet anymore. That's no. one of the things I don't like about the internet, is it loses stuff. Right, it, 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 it will pass one way or another, for one reason or another. Yeah. So facts aren't always facts forever. Yeah, but, uh, and I, I happen to think, though, that in the in the particular Smithsonian article, there was a story about they emphasized a lot about Kramich. Yeah. And it sounded familiar to me, and I looked back, and we had actually gotten an email from him some time before, and he was asking about various people here. Now, I never found anyone that admitted uh, that they knew they remembered him. Uh, all the people I run into who were veterans of the uh, uh, the his days in the, yeah. at, at Unit 3. Uh, the only one who sort of thought he remembered was Howard before, but Howard's memory was getting kind of queasy at that time. Yes, so, I mean, I mean it's 60, for a 60 years, at least 50 years. Yeah. Six, pretty close to 60 years by then. Yeah, but... Uh, and it was, you know, a few months. Yeah, Dick. Uh, do you know where he worked or who he worked for? He, he was assigned the head of, uh, to, to do the health physics group for the Dayton project. So, and he was a military enlisted man, so in principle, he, you know, he would just report to whoever was head of the lab at that time, because he was, he was not a Monsanto employee, he would have been an, an army guy assigned to do a service. And so, and he was only here, again, from roughly the 1st of July Till the end of January, and then you know other people would would, would take over. The the, uh, the leader of the whole business was a gentleman named Bernard Wolf, and Cobal uh, uh, was he was head of health physics at Unit Three. Yeah. And and uh, John Bradley was head of uh, health physics. At Yeah, Charles? Um, since he came here apparently just a couple months before Hiroshima and Nagasaki and was here a short time, uh, was he doing the kind of work here? Was, was he still sending secrets to Russia? Was any of the important stuff he sent to Russia coming from his work at Dayton or was it all from Oak Ridge? It's Dayton or, too, you know. because Oak Ridge, everything worked on the need to know back in the Manhattan Project. So the people at Oak Ridge wouldn't know most of them wouldn't know what, what would happen to the next phase. And so the thing was, they were only, the, the, the three bombs that were exploded, the Trinity one in, in July and the, 
in the two in October. And only Fat Man and Trinity worked by the plutonium. And yet the the uh, little boy was a uh, uh, uranium bomb, which is a different mechanism. You know, they had a different initiation process, although they, there was an initiator in there. It wasn't the primary thing. But they were still making more components after those two were exploded, because they had others, and they did tests in 46. So production didn't stop. They were still processing them and, and doing that. But again, it was very compartmentalized. You know, those of us that worked in Mound, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, also, you, if it wasn't your job, you weren't supposed to know about it. So unless, unless it was there, so, you know, but a health physics guy, as a health, former fellow, they go under a lot of different areas. Now, you're not supposed to know what other people are doing, but, you know, you, you have a clearance, you're trying to help them solve something, you, you know, they think they got a problem, they have to explain that a little more to you. And here was a man who was very intelligent, technically trained, who understood a lot of stuff. I mean, if you take a guy off the farm and train him to, to take a reading, that's not the same thing as having an educated scientist. No one knew he was an educated, that he had a, you know, a, a, a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from Moscow, electrical engineering, you know, training, lots of stuff. So here was a man with a lot more basic knowledge than the average guy. So he was the perfect spy, the perfect mold, the conduit for information. And that's the message I want to you know, try to get across. Now, my opinion is, you know, for what he did, probably should have been executed. However, at the time, the Soviet Union was our ally. You know, the other people, like folks and others, they were sentenced to prison. And they, they you know, Flukes was a British citizen, but others. You know, if he had been caught, you know, it's one thing to, in World War II to give information to a Nazi. That's the enemy. That's, that's a automatically. You, they don't, you don't even have a trial. Really. They take you out against the wall and shoot you. But when you're through an alloy, that's a naughty. You could go to prison, you know, but it wasn't the same thing. It evolved later that it was, but, you know, in, in hindsight. But, well, I got a bunch of questions. Paul. Is there any speculation on who his handler was, or there, there there's some speculation on, on 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 names, but I don't know if it's been proven. There's still a, a couple names that float around. They know who his handler was, that who he worked for in New York, but he wasn't part of the of the Manhattan Project feed information. And you know, however they did that, I mean, they, I'm sure all spy organization guard with even more than top secret, how they actually communicate. I need to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you, you may want to know, but you don't need to know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll answer that a little what? bit. Typically, handlers would uh, directly um, communicate with an embassy. Almost all secrets, uh, Soviet spies went through an embassy. That was kind of maybe the main hub of, of, uh, of all secrets that went over. There wasn't a lot of other ways of doing it, so it's a matter of, and handlers typically change often too, as well. So um, eventually, did. that information should go to the embassy. And yeah. Then, yeah, it would typically then, find yeah. its way through various yeah. different handlers um, as well, um, and other types of couriers. Um, and it wasn't always a uh, an actual physical document like you would think. Uh, there was different ways of coding things, um, and different, and it would be very short. Um, you know, it wouldn't be a lengthy 20-page yeah. document. You know, you're going to keep it short, and you're going to find ways to to mask that. And then usually the the Soviet embassy um, uh, here in the United States would would send that over to to the Soviet. Union. They had diplomatic immunity. Mm -hmm. They were an ally. ally. You put anything in a diplomatic pouch. Yeah. That's the other country's stuff. You you know, that's an act of war. To in, in, right. So it was it was secure. Yeah. Once you got to the embassy, it was yeah. I mean, we had Soviet spies, you know, obviously sending secrets through the, so through the Soviet embassies here in the United States, obviously well into the end of the Cold War. That was the main hub. But you've also got to think these embassies sit on their own ground. So um, there was a lot of things we couldn't do and couldn't touch. Even in the midst of the, the height of the Cold War, we couldn't really touch the Soviet embassy right. um, in a lot of ways, yeah. Yes. I realize your information is limited, uh, but in this research, did you under, uh, uh, under uh, cover the China connection and everything China was doing here in the 40s? 
No. For Oak Ridge and... No. I, the, if, if there's a China connection, there, there could be. You know, that didn't come up in any of the things that I saw. So. I mean, we had a connection because those of us that worked at the Mount Laboratory evolved out of, out of the Dayton project for the Manhattan project. And there were individuals that, when I worked here in the 70s, who were still, you know, middle management that had stuff. But again, the fact that you use polonium and beryllium for initiator was classified till the 80s. You know, so what he, the code name Urchin would be in existence, but you couldn't identify what it was. As far as I know, the dimensions and configurations have never been declassified. I don't know that. I don't know them. But nobody's going to, you know, they're, they're not, you know, I've never seen a document on the internet. There are a lot of it used to have secret crossed out and said, this is, a, this is the recipe. I've never seen that, whether it was out there. So, anyway, well, I want to thank you for your attention. I, I don't think I have anything else. And if I have another opportunity, maybe it'll be some more good stuff we'll find out. But. <laughs>